January 3rd, 2026, Caracas, Venezuela. Public reporting says Operation Absolute Resolve is over. The headline is the capture. The real story is the architecture. Over 150 aircraft from 20 separate launch points, timed into one city in one narrow window. That creates a problem most militaries cannot solve. How do you run that many assets in the dark without collision, without fratricide, and still keep an air seal tight enough for special operations to insert, hit the target, and extract clean? Because if you can do that, firepower is not your advantage. System control is. In this episode, we're going inside the 150, the air stack, the command brain that writes the tempo, and the invisible layer that makes everything else possible. Chapter 1 starts with the simplest question. What does 150 actually mean? Chapter 1. The Anatomy of the Package To the untrained eye, 150 aircraft looks like a swarm. To a mission planner, it looks like architecture. In modern U.S. doctrine, raw numbers don't equal capability. Structure does. What public reporting describes over Venezuela is an integrated air package, a stack of capabilities layered vertically and horizontally, built to sanitize a specific volume of airspace for a specific window of time. When the mission demands a zero-fail insertion and extraction from a hostile capital, you don't bet on luck. You buy redundancy. So where does 150 go? It goes into building an air control chain the enemy cannot disrupt. Layer 1. Battle Management The E-2D Advanced Hawkeye, the quarterback, it provides a God's eye view of the battle space, detecting threats early, deconflicting traffic, and vectoring assets in real time. Without this layer, the package is blind. Layer 2 Air Dominance The F-22 Raptor and F-35 Lightning II their mandate is air superiority, pushing the threat ring outward and making any attempt to contest the air a losing decision. Layer 3. The Non-Kinetic Breach. SEAD. Suppression of Enemy Air Defenses. Enter the EA-18G Growler. These platforms dominate the electromagnetic spectrum. They jam search radars, disrupt command and control, and deny surface-to-air batteries a clean targeting picture. They don't open the door with explosives. They open it by turning off the enemy's eyes. Layer 4. The Kinetic Hammer. B-1B Lancers and F-A-18 Super Hornets. In this operation, they're the on-call insurance policy. Heavy ordnance ready for time-sensitive targets if the ground picture starts to slide. So when you analyze the number 150, understand this. It's not a parade of force. It's a synchronized machine. Every aircraft is a gear, and every gear turns in unison to guarantee one thing, control. Chapter two. The Geometry of the Attack If Chapter 1 was about the what, Chapter 2 is about the where. Because the brilliance here was not just the asset count, it was the launch geometry. Those 150 aircraft did not scramble from a single runway. They converged from roughly 20 distinct nodes across the Western Hemisphere, from CONUS, to forward hubs in the Caribbean, to maritime platforms operating offshore. This is textbook distributed force employment. Why disperse? 
First, to shatter the enemy's situational awareness. When an attack vector originates from a single azimuth, the defense can orient and concentrate. But when the threat picture shows multiple vectors at once, command and control become saturated. They cannot separate the feint from the main effort. They see noise. And inside that noise, the United States finds its gap. Second, dispersion optimizes the platform to the mission. Take the B-1B Lancer. A mainland launch, tanker support, a strike window, and a return home. That is global reach with minimal forward footprint. Contrast that with the USS Gerald R. Ford Carrier Strike Group. A carrier is 4.5 acres of, effectively, sovereign American territory. It reduces dependence on host nation basing and permissions, and puts persistent air power on station, where geography demands it. Then, the forward hubs. Reports point to Roosevelt Roads in Puerto Rico as a staging area. In a time-sensitive raid, you want short legs, assets that must be close to the fight to reduce latency, especially UAVs and ISR support. Guantanamo Bay may have served as a transit node, keeping the flow of fuel, crews, and logistics moving without interruption. And finally, the USS Iwo Jima. An amphibious assault ship is not just a platform. It is a floating safe house. Medical capability on hand, secure spaces for command and control, and a controlled environment to process a high-value target the moment extraction is complete. By spreading 150 assets across 20 launch points, the United States removes the single point of failure. If weather shuts one field or a tanker track shifts, the network adapts. The mission does not pause. That is the difference between a simple airstrike and a complex campaign built to survive friction. Chapter 3. The Conductor of Chaos Here is the brutal reality of air warfare. The enemy is not your only problem. Chaos is. When you compress 150 high-performance aircraft into a confined battle space, at night, moving at different speeds and altitude blocks, the margin for error evaporates. In that environment, collision and blue-on-blue -blue can become the dominant risk, sometimes even before the enemy gets a clean shot. So how do you prevent catastrophe? You do not just send aircraft, you send a governance structure. Enter the CAOC, the Combined Air Operations Center, the Nerve Center, the Brain, the Conductor. The primary tool of the CAOC is the ATO, the Air Tasking Order. It sounds like paperwork. It is actually the source code for the operation. The ATO dictates who flies, with what loadout, on what timeline, and most critically, who protects whom. To manage density, planners use deconfliction. The sky is sliced into altitude blocks and corridors. High altitude assets, fighters sweeping below, drones separated, helicopters down in the dirt flying nap of the earth. Everyone stays in their lane, by design, not by luck. But lanes are not enough. You need zones, R-O-Zs. Restricted operating zones are tightly controlled boxes built around the most fragile piece of the puzzle, the Special Operations Corridor. Nothing enters without strict, time-sensitive clearance. That is how you protect slow-moving helicopters in a fast-moving sky. Conversely, kill boxes are pre-designated grids with pre-cleared rules of engagement within defined parameters. They speed the sensor-to-shooter loop without turning the airspace into a free-for-all. And finally, the digital handshake. IFF, identification, friend, or foe. In the confusion of night combat, visual identification is a fantasy. 
IFF allows friendly systems to separate a known friendly from an unknown track in seconds. Without the KAOC and the ATO, 150 aircraft is a traffic jam waiting to happen. With them, 150 separate cockpits behave like one organism. They do not just share the sky, they control it. And once you can control the sky like a system, the first strike does not have to be a bomb. It can be a blackout. Chapter 4 The Invisible War Before the first rotor blade spun up, the war had likely already begun. Reports from Caracas describe a blackout. The city went dark. To the civilian, the power went out. To the military analyst, this is the shaping phase. Modern warfare does not begin with a bang. It begins with silence. Cyber Command and space capabilities can shape the battle space before the first aircraft ever crosses a coastline. The objective is system disruption. Fragment the enemy's nervous system so the parts cannot fight as a whole. Cyber pressure targets command nodes, communications relays, and the glue that connects radar, missile batteries, and leadership. If the links degrade, the air defense picture collapses into isolated islands. At the same time, space enables the foundation, PNT, positioning, navigation, and timing. In a multi-domain operation timed to the minute, timing is not a convenience. It is the heartbeat. Lose timing, and the entire choreography starts to drift. Then, the electromagnetic warheads arrive. The EA-18G Growler. In this phase, the Growler can be the most dangerous aircraft in the sky without firing a shot. Its mission is spectrum dominance. Deny the enemy a clean view of reality. It jams search radars, muddies tracking, and forces operators to doubt what they are seeing. Are those fighters on the scope real, or is it ghosting? By the time they sort truth from noise, the window is closing. But here is the detail most people miss. Electronic warfare is not free. The same noise that blinds the enemy can also blind you. That is why spectrum deconfliction matters. Growlers, battle managers, and the rest of the package must coordinate emissions so the U.S. doesn't jam its own data links while trying to jam the other side. And jamming alone rarely buys you more than time. To buy safety, the package pairs non-kinetic attack with seed. Electronic attack sets the table. Seed carries the knife. Jamming buys seconds. Suppression buys minutes. And minutes are exactly what a helicopter raid needs. Watching it all unfold is the stealth ISR layer. Reports reference assets like the RQ-170 Sentinel. Silent, low signature, feeding real-time updates. Not just where the targets are, but how the defenses are behaving. Whether a radar lights up, whether a mobile battery displaces, whether the pattern changes. The blackout, the cyber pressure, the electronic attack. This was not just about turning off the lights. It was about severing the enemy's OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, act. The U.S. did not simply fly into Caracas. They blinded the guards before they ever reached the door. Chapter 5 the golden hour, two o'clock, a clock a.m., local time. The decisive phase begins. The 160th soar, the Night Stallers, cross the threshold. Delta Force on board. Nap of the Earth profiles, skimming terrain and rooftops to stay below the radar horizon. This is the most fragile moment of the operation. Helicopters are slow, they are loud, they are vulnerable. One man pads launch, one burst of concentrated fire, and the mission can fail. This is why the number 150 exists. Those aircraft are not there to flatten Caracas. They are there to hold a defensive umbrella over the rotorcraft. 
The E-2D shifts from surveillance to active battle management. Fighters hold the high ground, pushing the threat ring outward and making any intercept a losing decision. And the unsung center of gravity is the tanker force. The refueling tracks orbiting on the periphery. Without them, fighters have to leave station. If they leave, the umbrella collapses. Tankers keep the roof intact for the duration of the raid. Then comes the exfil. Getting in is hard, getting out is harder. By now, the enemy is awake. Surprise is bleeding out by the minute. Fog of war creeps in, but the package holds. Suppression continues. The team lifts with the HVT and runs the gauntlet back to the USS Iwo Jima into a controlled security bubble. Extracting clean while a hostile nation wakes up around you is the ultimate test of the system. Operation Absolute Resolve sends a message beyond Venezuela. The lesson is not superior airframes. It is system integration under pressure. It is tempo. Enter, execute, leave before the enemy can complete the OODA loop. By the time Venezuelan forces understood the scope of the raid, the package was already dissolving and the target was gone. For any potential adversary watching, the question is not, can you shoot down an American jet? The question is, can you disrupt the rhythm of a machine this complex? Because if you cannot break the tempo, you are already behind the war. This is Future War Tech. Briefing adjourned.